It was the eeriest scene you can imagine. A vast, empty scrubland bathed in stark white moonlight. The desert stretched endlessly in every direction. It looked ghoulish, and it was very cold, and absolutely still. There was nothing out there, and yet, as I lay on the ground, panting and sweating with fear, the sounds of the insects and distant coyotes seemed deafening. I kept praying that no one had spotted me. Please, God, don't let the searchlights find me. I waited for the sentries, rifles on their shoulders, to pass. If they saw me, I was dead. I held my breath and lay motionless in the moonlight. They passed only a couple of yards away and continued along the length of the parallel rows of barbed wire fences. I was almost free. Sharply etched in black in the middle of the desert was a large prison camp. Long rows of squat barracks surrounded by huge guard towers, armed sentries and miles of barbed wire fences. The camp held more than 600 inmates and I had been one of them. It wasn't a prison for Americans, even though it was only 50 miles outside Lordsburg, New Mexico. We were all German soldiers part of the more than 425,000 of us who were captured in North Africa and Europe and brought to America in captivity. I was a sergeant in Rommel's Africa Corps and had planned this escape for weeks. The moment had arrived and my life now hung in the balance. Please, God, don't let them see me. I inched away from the fence, farther and farther. A searchlight swept terrifyingly close, and I froze until it went by. So far, so good. A few more yards, wild-eyed, I rose to a crouch and moved stealthily into the desert. No shots. I began to think that I might make it. When I finally dared to look back, I was startled to see the prison camp almost half a mile in the distance, the searchlights moving along the perimeter of the silent dark complex. They hadn't seen me after all. I paused to catch my breath, double-checked my direction toward the distant freight train on the horizon, and began to run for my life. After more than two decades in Weimar Germany and Nazi Germany, months on the battlefields of North Africa, and two years in American prisoner of war camps, I was finally and gloriously free. I was 24 years old. Forty years have passed since World War II, and I can still remember the moment I escaped from the prisoner of war camp. Whenever I let my mind drift to that September night in 1945, I can visualise every scene unfolding like a slow-motion movie. For weeks, I had been planning my escape from the prison camp, pacing off the perimeter of the campgrounds, and estimating distances between the long rows of tar paper barracks and the guard towers, between the sentry boxes and the barbed wire fences. To any of the other 600 German combat veterans in Camp Daming, in a remote southwestern corner of New Mexico, I was simply Unteroffizier Kobe Georg Geertner. My POW number was 81G80392, and I lived in Barracks 6TT. I had been captured on April 13, 1943, during the Battle for Tunis, and shipped with thousands of other prisoners to the prison camps in the United States. Nearly half a million of us Nazis, captured on the battlefields of North Africa and Europe, spent the remainder of the war years in America. We brought in the harvests, worked in the factories, and maintained the military posts. It still astonishes me that most Americans today don't even realise that we were here. The photograph that appeared on FBI wanted posters in government buildings and post offices for nearly 40 years shows a tall, rangy, rural kid, a bit weather-beaten around the eyes from months of squinting in the scorching sun of North Africa. There was also a look of weariness and sadness, almost a haunted stare. The eyes of a kid who had seen too much of life too quickly. Yet, at the same time, and perhaps I am the only one who can really tell, there is an impishness there as well, a twinkle for a new adventure. Add to that face a pair of wide ears, which I spent most of my childhood lamenting, and a rather long, prominent nose, which my mother called noble, and you have the young Georg Gertner. Every now and again over the past forty years, I have daringly strolled near my own wanted poster on a post office wall for a quick glance of reacquaintance with my youth. The poster was always real enough, however, 
as was the fact that I was, am a federal fugitive. I am an escaped German prisoner of war and have been hunted by the FBI, United States Army Security, Immigration, and every local police force in the country. I have often speculated on the fact that any person who walked through a post office or VA building or tax department, any government bureau with a bulletin board, could be the one to take away my freedom. Someone walking toward me might recall the wanted poster as our eyes met. Any passing acquaintance in life could recognise my picture months or years later and call the police. The cop who stopped me for speeding or who simply pulled alongside me at a red light could be the one to put me in the penitentiary. Arrest was always moments away. When the war ended and all 425,000 German prisoners were shipped out, the War Department was unable to account for only 12 prisoners. I was one of them. I have remained at large until the publication of this memoirs nearly 40 years. No other German prisoner of war has been a fugitive longer. My odyssey began that September in Camp Deming, New Mexico. Escapes among the prisoners of war were not uncommon. As prisoners of war, we all had heard stories about our comrades who had somehow managed to break out. The camp rumour mills often relayed exciting tales about one of our boys. We always solemnly concluded with admiration that he must have been an Africa Corps man who had made a daring escape through an elaborate tunnel or who audaciously strolled through the main gate wearing a camp-made replica of an American uniform. We whistled in admiration when we heard about someone who had pole vaulted over the double fence from an adjacent barracks roof, or slipped out hanging beneath a truck. We even grudgingly commended the unimaginative majority, who simply walked away from their lightly guarded work parties that were contracted out to local farmers. Everyone knew someone who was collecting equipment for a possible escape. An SO map swiped from the glove compartment of an army jeep, a pair of stolen pliers a few hidden dollars, illegal to prisoners of war for a possible bribe to a guard. Some of the boys, and that's really what we were, thought of little else. Their motives differed, however. There were those who just had cabin fever and talk it incessantly about what they would do on the outside, the cities they would see and the girls they would meet. The professional military men, nobody I knew considered it their patriotic duty to escape, as did a small, secretive group of dyed-in-the-wool Nazis who spent most of their time muttering ominously about taking our names for punishment after Germany won the war. These men we avoided, as much because of their boring political tirades, as by the nagging fear that they might turn to vigilante justice if they got the opportunity. Most of us were simply non-political and grateful to be out of the war. We were determined to make the best of a bad situation. Food was certainly better here than in the German army, and we had a wide variety of distractions, PX canteen, newspapers, concerts and plays put on by the men, and correspondence courses through local universities. I even played in the tennis championships at one camp. Sometimes we had wine and beer in the PX canteen, and we ate meat dishes three days a week while the rest of America was rationed and counting up red meat points. No wonder most of the local communities dourly referred to their nearby prisoner of war camps as the Fritz Ritz. Hell, under those conditions you couldn't drive most of the men out of those camps. Still, it was far from a rosy life. We were in a prison, after all. However comfortable, we were in a strange and hostile country, thousands of miles from our homes and families. True, we were out of the war and in the relatively gentle care of the United States. Our safety was ensured by both the Geneva Convention of 1929 and by Washington's anxious commitment to our comfort as the best assurance of similar treatment by the German government toward the 90,000 American prisoners of war in its hands. But, if I had to reduce our lives as prisoners of war at Camp Deeming, two, say, three basic problems, they would be. The scorching heat and an occasional chance meeting with a new Mexican rattlesnake a potential brush with the Nazis and unbowed militarists in our midst, and boredom. I know it must seem hard to believe that with all the diversions available to us, not to mention the many social activities and crafts programmes provided to us by the YMCA and the Catholic Welfare Agency, boredom was our biggest problem. Much of our day was spent in idle chatter and aimless strolls. 
Remember that I was a prisoner of war for more than two years. The boredom was compounded by our isolation. The war was remote, thank God. And most of the war news was depressing for us. We had little contact with our American guards, not the cream of the crop anyway, and few of us had ever seen our camp commandants Captain Daniel J. Smith, Lieutenant John A. Doyle, and Lieutenant Seymour Geller, who came and left. We lived a standard military routine. Up at 06.30 a.m., breakfast of oatmeal and coffee between 00700 and 0800, then off to our assignments. Most of us at Deeming worked at maintenance jobs around the camp or as clerks at the nearby Army Air Force Base. At other camps, especially those closer to civilization, prisoners of war were contracted out to labor-starved farmers or as assembly line workers in local factories. I heard about one bunch of prisoners of war who spent the war years, ironically, as kosher meat packers in Farmington, New Jersey. Moreover, we were paid 80 cents a day in the canteen coupons in lieu of United States currency. 80 cents a day doesn't sound like much today, but in those days, it bought eight packs of cigarettes or eight beers. My jobs ranged from a clerk typist in the administration building to my job at the time of my escapee as draftsman at the post engineer's office. Most often, however, the fact that I had studied English before the war, what a fortuitous decision, made me the unofficial camp translator. I was often called upon to interpret the Commandant's occasional instructions to the prisoners of war or a War Department memo posted on our camp bulletin board. Our routine was broken by a lunch of bologna sandwiches, then back to our petty tasks until late afternoon. The rest of our day was spent socialising, conspiring, pursuing hobbies, writing letters. Dinner in the large mess barracks usually consisted of spaghetti, chipped beef on toast, SOS familiar to any military man, or corned beef hash, milk and coffee, followed by pudding or locally available fruit. Evenings were spent playing dominoes or cards in the PX canteen. It sounds like a restful schedule, I'll admit, but as the weeks turned into months and the months years, time became a heavy burden. Yet, like most of the prisoners who endured the same mind-numbing existence, I was resigned to the situation and tried to make the best of it. Life behind the wire was boring, God knows, but tolerable. I had no serious interest in escaping. Besides, where would I go? When my ship arrived at Norfolk, Virginia, from the holding pens in North Africa, I was transported by train to my new home. For the first time I realised how vast America was. Europeans had no concept of such distances. The impressions of the United States, held by most Germans, including Hitler, were formed by the adolescent novels of Karl May. He wrote dozens of wildly popular books about the Old West frotly novels like Old Shatterhand and Old Winnetou without ever having been in America. Generations of us learned about a mythical United States from those little potboilers. Far from being a distant frontier, sparsely populated by pioneer families and noble red men, America, as we learned to our astonishment from the windows of our prisoners of war troop train, was sophisticated, industrial, and almost endless. It took nearly ten days to reach my first destination at Camp McLean, Texas. America was startlingly large, and I had long ago shrugged off any serious thoughts of getting back to Germany on my own. Moreover, a prisoner of war who tried to escape was taking a real chance on being killed. However well planned and imaginative the effort, the man who stepped into the kill zone between the two barbed wire fences surrounding the camp risked a burst of machine gun fire from the high sentry towers. We were certainly warned often enough, one, hair from a guard, then he was free to shoot. Furthermore, it was generally accepted knowledge that the bright yellow letters, PW, stenciled on the front and back of our uniforms and work clothes were to serve as targets. We all heard stories about guards who were particularly trigger-happy men who had been recently recycled home from combat overseas, or who had been prisoners of war themselves in Germany and were given a soft job in the backwater of the war. Whatever the army's reasoning, these men made particularly dangerous guards. We heard new horror stories about the skittish temperament of the prisoners of war guards every time a group of prisoners passed through Camp Deming in transit to some other camp. 
other stories we read in the newspapers. The following incidents I know to be true. At Camp Concordia, Kansas, for example, a German prisoner was shot to death while trying to retrieve a soccer ball that he had defiantly kicked into the fences. Another incident occurred at Fort Knox, Kentucky, when two prisoners of war were killed by a guard who repeatedly warned them to clear the fence area. At Camp Ovid, Colorado, three men were killed by a guard, recently recycled from combat overseas, when they appeared to attack him. And at a branch camp near Palmer, Ohio, a guard shot a German prisoner of war after he was repeatedly warned to stop singing a song that ridiculed American servicemen. Thus, we were keenly aware that our guards were not to be trifled with. We were also aware that they were getting more hostile during the closing months of the war. The invading Allied armies revealed the horrible atrocities of the concentration camps and mass extermination centres. Such unspeakable barbarity repelled all civilised men, especially those of us in the Africa Corps who had spent our military years a continent away from these events. Many of us were sickened that we represented, fought for, a government that would do such things. To our guards, however, we were all simply Nazis. We were all guilty. And for many years, illogically, I felt that I had somehow contributed to those horrors. The end of the war also meant that the United States would soon have its captured soldiers back from enemy hands. With their liberation, we all realised the War Department no longer needed to worry about our comfort. Our treatment in the United States would no longer affect the safety of the American prisoners of war in German hands. We knew it and, to our growing apprehension, we knew that the guards knew it. There was an increasingly unfriendly aura between us, but few prisoners of war considered the risks of escape worthwhile. We'd just stick it out. We followed the deteriorating course of the war over the radio and through newspapers. Both were made available to us by the American authorities who, to their great credit, worked hard to show us the benefits of democracy and a free society. Most of us had spent our formative adolescent years under the Nazis, and, as basic as an uncensored press may seem to Americans, it was rather strange to us. We had grown up with politics and propaganda. The War Department courageously put democracy into action, perhaps as an experiment with a captive audience, or to prepare us for life in post-war Europe, and every camp received subscriptions to the New York Times and local state newspapers. Each barrack also received a radio. We were suspicious for months, of course, since we couldn't believe that the United States would allow us to read about such things as union strikes, race riots, and military reversals. To be honest, we started out delighted at the embarrassing articles about labour or food shortages, gangland killings, and of America's blatant discrimination against its black citizens. We were astonished that the government would allow such negative items to reach print, especially during wartime, when such information could be used as propaganda by the enemy. Gradually we began to realise that if the government was willing to disclose its failures to the public, then surely the positive items were true as well. What finally convinced us that we were not being fed propaganda, I believe, was the news of the Battle of the Bulge in December 1944. Every day we followed with fascination the detailed accounts of the savage fighting. The US Army caught off guard and driven back by the last-ditch German offensive, the miscalculations made by both sides. And finally, the disintegration of the Wehrmacht and the Allied invasion of the Fatherland. Understandably, we went from elation to depression during that last week of 1944, as the ultimate outcome became clear. But at the same time, we knew the reports were accurate. We also learned that whatever the drawbacks of democracy, and we knew there were many, it represented truth in practice. All but the most embittered among us admitted that given a choice, we would choose democracy with little hesitation. Since I was the unofficial camp translator, it was my responsibility to read the news to the men. That assignment not only helped to perfect my English, but convinced me, perhaps more than the others, about the importance of freedom to the growth of the human spirit. Yet, however noble my thoughts, they were still only thoughts. The danger of escape still outweighed the benefits. 
Maybe the end of the war would offer me some new options. On May 2nd, 1945, we were dumbstruck to learn of Hitler's suicide. Somehow, we had grown to believe that de Führer was invulnerable. The men reacted as one might expect. Some were despondent, after all, we had been raised to revere him. Others were angry that Hitler would have taken the coward's way out after dragging Germany into a disastrous world war. Most of us, however, were generally saddened, not about Hitler, but about the death of Germany. What would we be returning to when they finally sent us home? Home was all we could think about now that the war was officially over. We discussed the options endlessly. The rumour mills shifted into high gear, and those in the no usually a clerk for an American officer produced steady streams of authoritative and ever-changing scenarios. Our dream, of course, sir, was to be shipped back to Germany as soon as possible. While the papers were filled with stories about ruined cities, starvation conditions and social chaos, Germany was our home. Our families and loved ones were there. But the realities of the situation indicated that an early return home was improbable. At the end of one late night's heated discussion, we agreed that we were not going directly back to Germany. Considering the devastation and upheaval, the US occupation forces in Germany would not welcome the appearance of more than 400,000 well-fed German combat veterans. Who knew how many unrepentant Nazis were among us we often wondered ourselves, or how many hard cases who didn't consider themselves bound by the official surrender. There was still talk about a final uprising by Nazi fanatics in the so-called Southern Redoubt. The facts were overwhelming. The War Department wouldn't chance shipping us home at this time. Moreover, we even wondered if American farmers, desperate for workers until the troops came home, would allow the government to ship us anywhere. Then, at the end of another impassioned late-night discussion, we also came to the opposite conclusion. We would probably not remain in the United States much longer. Our new reasoning was based on the fact that the American public was in an ugly mood regarding Germans. The recent unfolding of the horrors of Auschwitz, Dachau, Buchenwald, Mauthausen and Belsen made us all appear to be mass murderers. Then the public learned about the shocking massacre of more than 70 American prisoners, hands bound, at Malmedy, Belgium, by an SS unit during the Battle of the Bulge. Grizzly news photographs of the unearthed scene enraged the nation further against Germans, though we, as military men, were equally outraged by such barbarism. Reports then began to appear in the papers about the poor treatment received by American prisoners of war held in German camps. Americans were furious that their kindness toward nearly half a million German prisoners of war in the United States was seldom reciprocated by the other side. Returning American prisoners of war disclosed episodes about being marched 500 miles through snow and rain, of eating cats and fighting over potato peelings, of beatings and other cruelties. In the camp, we found ourselves increasingly shaken by the stupidity and inhumanity of the government we had fought for. We were also growing mildly concerned for our safety. The quality of our camp food deteriorated rapidly which we attributed to public hostility and the fact that, with the war over, Washington no longer needed to protect US prisoners by coddling us. Relations with our camp guards, erratic during the best of times, were becoming ominously tense. Even those guards, often kids themselves who had befriended the prisoners, were silent and glowering. The newspapers were filled with anti-Nazi tirades, and public interest began to focus on our fate. Union leaders thundered that we were taking jobs from returning vets and that we should be shipped out immediately. Legislation to begin our repatriation was introduced by Representative George Bender of Ohio, Senator Maybank of South Carolina and Senator McMahon of Connecticut, and the Wisconsin legislature rose as a body to demand our prompt deportation lest the gainful employment of our citizenry be seriously jeopardised. We watched, transfixed, as our fate was debated in the press. We were horrified to see a reader suggest in the New York Times that a shortage of blood plasma be filled by the systematic bleeding of the German prisoners of war in the United States. 
Don't think that didn't make us squirm. Clearly, a growing segment of the American public wanted us out as soon as the returning troops came home to pick up the labour slack. But when that might be, or where we would be sent, was still hotly debated. Through the late summer of 1945, we waited with growing anxiety about our fate. The answer appeared on our camp bulletin board the first week in September. Several dozen men, I remember, crowded around me in the hot morning sun to hear the translation of the War Department announcement. As I ploughed through the several paragraphs of bureaucraties, our future came into focus. The War Department declared that we would not be repatriated directly to Germany, which we had already concluded, nor were we to remain in the United States, which we had also concluded. In a Solomon-like decision, the War Department had found a middle ground. The German prisoners of war were to be shipped to Europe and they're turned over to the British and French for use as labourers on post-war reconstruction projects. Groans rippled through the crowd, although we each gave silent thanks that Russia was not mentioned. The prospect of being shipped to Russia was always our greatest terror, a whispered and almost primeval fear. Moreover, in light of Washington's frantic efforts to prevent a total rupture of relations with the USSR, a Russian request for our labour might well have been honoured. We dared not even think about the treatment of German prisoners of war in Russian hands. A slave labour camp, Siberia, or worse. OK, so it was to be France and England, England being our immediate choice considering the brutal German occupation of France and perhaps two more years until we saw home. Some of the milling men were muttering about being no better than slave labour, and the United States being in the slave trade, but most continued to listen in resigned silence. At least we weren't being shipped to Russia. I continued to translate the next part of the bulletin. In the very near future, the exact date depending on available transportation, all the prisoners in small satellite branch camps, like our Camp Deeming, would be funneled to the larger base. Camps ours was Camp Lordsburg, New Mexico. From there, the prisoners of war would be taken by train to a port of embarkation where we would be placed aboard any available vessels for shipment to England and France. All 425,000 men. No exceptions. Then my eyes moved down to the final paragraph and I froze. I tried to compose myself and read the sentence that was to soon change my life. After finishing our labour stints in Britain and France, we would be shipped to Germany and returned directly to our hometowns. Several men in the group gasped as they also realised the significance of the directive. Some of our hometowns had fallen under Russian occupation. We were not going to be discharged as a group somewhere in the American zone in West Germany, as we had always assumed. Those of us from cities now in East Germany were to be turned over to the Soviets, which did indeed happen, and we all knew what that meant. I barely managed to control my rising panic as I walked numbly back to my barrack. I was being turned over to the Russians. My fate was sealed. I spent the next several days lying on my bunk, turning the directive over in my mind. There was no question that my city of Schweidnitz near Leipzig in East Prussia was many hundreds of miles within the Soviet zone. My camp job, after all, had been to translate the radio and newspaper war reports for the rest of the men, like people everywhere during the war. We had followed the course of the battles with little coloured pins on a large wall map in the PX canteen. Those of us from East Prussia watched with horror during the winter of 1944 as the tide of red pins swept westward to engulf our homes. Some of us half-heartedly speculated that maybe the Soviets would withdraw to their own borders after the war, but we all knew better. Our homes and families were all but lost. We stopped talking about it, though the ominous fate of our loved ones was never far from our thoughts for the last six months of the war. Now that the War Department had made clear its intentions to send us back to our hometowns, regardless of zone, we thought of little else. There was no question that I was in real trouble. I was headed for the Soviet zone and God knows what. For the first time, I allowed myself to wonder about the condition of my family in Russian hands. 
It suddenly occurred to me that my parents and relatives might already be en route to Siberia. Perhaps my father's position with the Reichsbahn railroads had made him suspect, or the fact that I was a soldier in the Africa Corps had jeopardised their safety. We had corresponded periodically during the war, first from North Africa and later from my camps in America. But no letters had arrived for some time, due, I thought, to the chaos in Germany at the end of the war. But maybe it was more than that. Maybe they were prisoners themselves, or worse. My mind raced furiously to consider all the possibilities and weigh my options. Within a matter of days, I convinced myself, without another shred of evidence, that my parents and loved ones were lost. I know that it sounds odd, it seems curious to me today. But in retrospect, I realised that I had to do it. I had to convince myself that my parents were dead if I was to be free to act on my own. Nothing I did now could hurt them. I had burned my bridges behind me. I was so sure that they were dead that I nearly fainted some thirty-nine years later when I learned that my parents had not only survived the end of the war, but that they had escaped into the American zone and safety. To my astonishment, and no small amount of guilt. I found out that they had lived well into the 1960s and had passed away without ever giving up hope that I was alive. My picture remained on their dining room table until their deaths. In September 1945, however, I was preparing for my only apparent option, escape. Me. The quiet, non-political kid from the sticks, who had not been more than 50 miles from home before I joined the army. Until now, my main interests in life concerned sports and daydreams about girls. My head reeled at the prospect of the danger and adventure that awaited me. For the first time in my life, I was about to take charge of my future. The fact is that I was fed up with being told what to do. My childhood was typically German. Every member of the family knew what was expected, and our lives were regulated by tradition, habit, local public pressure, religion, and, after the Nazis took power in 1933, by the whims of a dictator as well. School was yet another model of order and discipline. The more I thought about it, the more I was determined to break free of it all and choose my own direction. I had always been told what to do, by my parents, teachers, priests, sports coaches, employers, everyone. What was not controlled by my family and teachers was regulated by the stifling German bureaucracy. It was a force that Americans simply cannot imagine. Every item and event in your life required a form, tax stamp, signature or passbook. School diplomas or wedding certificates weren't valid unless they had a little tax stamp in the corner. Permits were required for just about everything, and they had files on everyone. That was one of the ways the Nazis took over so quickly. They simply took control of the bureaucracy. Then came the army, and anyone who has been in the military knows what that means. The military runs on orders, discipline, and, in my opinion, mindless routine. We Germans have made militarism a national obsession, and the Nazis turned us into robots. The cutting edge, of course, was the German army, the Wehrmacht. It elevated discipline to a high art. Isn't that the stereotype of Germans? And frankly, it's not an unjustified image. Discipline has historically been the source of our greatest accomplishments and our most dismal failures. I've always found it ironic that we Germans are at the same time both aggressive and passive, dictatorial and humane. What Goethe called two souls in one breast. Winston Churchill put it more dramatically. The Germans are either at your feet or at your throat. I think there is something to that. The same country that produced Goethe, Fichte, Schopenhauer, the world's greatest philosophers, poets and musicians, also produced Bormann, Himmler, Goering, Heydrich and the rest of that gang. Fortunately, since we lost the war, we can blame Hitler on the Austrians. Anyway, it was the latter group who were in control as I grew up. I was a product of discipline and order, and after three years in the Wehrmacht and another two in American prisoners of war camps, I decided that I had had enough. No one was going to tell me what to do again. I was 24, after all, and wanted to travel, meet girls, play sports, and meet girls. 
and where better to find that independence than in America? We'd been lectured to death about the virtues of democracy. It was time to see for myself. I took stock of my survival skills. I was young and in pretty good health. I spoke English reasonably well. And while I had an accent, so did millions of American immigrants. I could teach skiing or tennis, having been a local champion in my youth. I was a good listener and got along well with everybody. Having been an apprentice draftsman as a schoolboy, I had an eye for detail and an awareness of distance. Both skills would be useful in avoiding traps or locating exits. Perhaps most importantly, I had the kind of face that would be overlooked in a crowd. I looked like any tall, skinny farm kid in America. After evaluating my skills and traits, I felt a momentary surge of confidence. I could make it. America. Here I come. Suddenly, there was purpose in my life. I was full of anticipation and the realization that only two barbed wire fences separated me from my new life. But first came the hard part. I had to escape. Moreover, I had to be successful the first time. There would be no second chance. Any misstep or plain bad luck would bring a barrage of bullets from the already trigger happy sentries. If the sentries didn't shoot me, I would be thrown in the camp stockade until it was time to ship me to East Germany. No matter how I looked at it, I had to break out of camp, I had to do it soon, and I had to do it right the first time. Plans raced through my mind. I quickly eliminated the complicated schemes since I had not accumulated the necessary escape items maps, tools, money, or counterfeit social security or draft card usually typed on a camp typewriter while an American officer was on his coffee break. Truthfully, I wasn't even sure how far Camp Daming was from anywhere. How naive I was then. My next decision was that I had to escape solo. If no one else knew my plan, no one could give me away, accidentally or otherwise. But how was I going to escape? Tunneling was out since there wasn't enough time or tools. I considered smuggling myself out in a civilian laundry or food truck, but I didn't know their schedules. No. Given the circumstances, the only way was to simply find a shadowy spot along the fence, wait for the right moment, and slip out under the wire. Then it would be a mad dash across the open desert scrubland to safety, wherever that was. There was my entire brilliant plan. Simple, solo, and, to continue the alliteration, stupid. It was dumb enough to work, I prayed, and began wandering around the camp in search of that ideal shadowy spot near the fence. Early in September, I had two great strokes of unexpected luck. The first came when my blue work fatigues came back from the camp laundry without the normally stenciled bright yellow letters, PW. I never heard of that happening before and offered silent thanks to the anonymous screw-up in every system. My original plan, what little there was, called for turning my stenciled work clothes inside out, until I could swipe something off a clothesline. Now I stood a far better chance of slipping into the American mainstream unnoticed. FBI posters later claimed that I had escaped in a stolen U.S. Army uniform with 2nd Air Force insignia, to be precise, which has irritated me to this day. It not only made me nervous about being charged with some sort of additional crime, but frankly, it hurt my pride. My second good fortune came as I was strolling around the camp, lost in a rising panic that each passing day was bringing me closer to learning Russian. I bumped into a group of men who were pointing to something off in the distance. I ambled over as they were discussing a far-off shiny glint moving on the horizon. It was a train, I couldn't believe it. Why had I never noticed that distant reflection before? I tried to look nonchalant as I tossed the men an airy salute and moved on, but I could barely control my excitement. First the unmarked work clothes, and now just a few days later. I found that a train passed four or five miles from the camp. The train now became my main obsession. I had to estimate its distance and figure out the schedule. My spirits soared as I felt success within my grasp. I immediately shifted my daily activities to the area of the camp closest to the railroad line 
and I created every imaginable reason that would enable me to stare off in that direction. I became an early morning bird-watching enthusiast. At noon I sat cross-legged in meditation, and during the afternoon I set up my makeshift easel and painted watercolours of the desert landscape. I remember being offered a pack of cigarettes for one of my better efforts, a princely sum in camp currency. Smugness aside, the sale gave me an excuse to remain near the fence for another hour, painting one more. It took me about ten days of this kind of activity to work out an accurate train schedule, and to my great relief, I confirmed that one train passed the camp every other day at ten o'clock at night. Talk about luck. In fact, the whole escape was beginning to take on an almost mystic quality, as though it was somehow predestined. The clothes, the train, my knowledge of English, everything pointed to success. Even today, forty years later, I believe my escape was preordained. I was meant to change my life in America. Considering that everything had fallen into place within four weeks of my decision to escape, I sometimes laughingly wonder what I could have accomplished if I had begun planning earlier. Given a year, I'll bet that I could have led the entire camp in a mass escape to freedom. By September 20th, 1945, I decided that I was as ready as I'd ever be. There was nothing to be gained by waiting. Indeed, the longer I waited, the greater the chances that something could go wrong. A change in the train schedule, or the discovery of my hidden work clothes. Our repatriation process to Europe might suddenly begin, or I might chicken out and take my chances with the Russians. There was an additional reason for moving quickly. I wanted to take advantage of the immediate post-war chaos. Millions of GIs were being demobilised and crowding the nation's train stations and bus depots. Factories were retooling for peacetime production, and the labour force was changing madly to keep pace, a perfect opportunity for the appearance of a nondescript skilled worker. Moreover, I also concluded that the end of the war meant the end of ID cards, security checks, ration books, and amateur spy catchers. The country was heady with victory, and the population caught in a maelstrom of movement. The longer I waited, the less my chances of slipping unnoticed into the general population. Given all these facts, and the feeling that fate was somehow presenting me with this single opportunity to save myself and begin life anew, I decided to throw the dice and escape the very next night, September 21st, 1945. All I would take along would be my small shaving kit and a silver ring I had bought from an Arab in North Africa. The inlaid emblem on the ring was perfect. It was a running antelope. I remember lying awake most of that night, going over and over the plan and vowing, rather melodramatically, that the next night would see me free, enslaved, or dead. I went through the next day in a sweaty daze. I loitered around the barracks near the fence and made furious mental notes for my dash in the dark. I calculated and recalculated the time I needed to reach the train as it moved slowly past Camp Deming. If I bolted too early, a surprise headcount back in camp would find me missing and easily caught out in the flat scrubland. Five minutes too late, and I would watch the train disappear in the distance. I gave myself thirty minutes to crawl under the double set of barbed wire and thirty minutes more to race the several miles to the train. One hour. According to my calculations, the train passed at 1,000 p.m. I would escape at 0900 while the men were watching the weekly movie. By dinner time, I was a nervous wreck. I was sure that every passing glance carried a knowing wink and every greeting a surreptitious good luck. With so many well wishers, I convinced myself, how could I back out now? At the stroke of 0900 p.m., while all the other men were jeering at a B Western movie in the camp mess hall, I slipped out of my barracks into the night. To my astonishment, I found myself not in a protective blanket of darkness as I had expected, but in the midst of a moonlit scene bright enough to read a newspaper by. I cursed my stupidity at overlooking the possibility of a full moon but went ahead. Scampering across the camp, I made it safely to the darkened corner of a barrack nearest to the wire fence. 
I stood in the shadows for several minutes, my heart pounding, as I watched the ominous sweeps of the searchlights over the silent prison camp. Back and forth, down the length of the fence, then slowly the beams moved back past me to the other end. All the way down, then back, down, then back. And as the searchlight went past me the next time, I stepped out of the shadow. Crouched over, I ran to the first fence. There was no turning back now. If a sentry spotted me, I could be shot. And if I ran back to the shadow and a sentry saw me, I could be shot as well. Nearly wild-eyed with fear, I scooted under the bottom strands of barbed wire, never noticing the cuts and scratches. Now I was in the so-called kill zone between the fences, barely able to control my panic. I forced myself to lie quietly next to the outer fence, hoping that the sound of my heart couldn't be heard all the way up into the guard tower. God, how could they not know I'm here? For a few seconds I even considered the possibility that they were all watching my torture, and when I made it under the last fence, the searchlights would rivet on me and bang I can still feel that exact moment. Lying next to the last fence, face pushed into the sandy soil, in bright moonlight, with the sentry's beam probing relentlessly down the kill zone toward me. Except for the sounds of the crickets and the muffled distant laughter from the movie barrack, the world around me was absolutely silent. As I huddled at the base of the fence, almost paralysed, the searchlight was moving inexorably toward me. Now. I mustered every ounce of reserve strength, lifted the lower strands of the barbed wire, and rolled under and out. No gunfire yet. I paused to catch my breath and clawed at my watch to see if I still had a chance to reach the train. According to the plan, I had only one hour to accomplish the whole escape, and I knew I had used up most of the time getting through the wire. I prayed I still had a few minutes left. As my watch came into view, I couldn't believe my eyes. It was only 0911 p.m. What I thought had been an eternity had lasted only eleven minutes. I could make it after all. I took a deep breath and inched away from the camp perimeter into the stark black-and-white lunar landscape of the New Mexican desert. It was an eerie, surrealistic scene, a bright moonlit tableau dotted with countless small black desert bushes. Between them were tall cactus plants like menacing sentinels, silhouetted every few hundred yards. At first I crept slowly away from the camp, still expecting a sudden shout of alarm followed by a hailstorm of bullets. I stopped to catch my breath and paused to look back. The full moon made the camp appear almost otherworldly, like science fiction. The fences and the rows of military barracks were starkly outlined in the ghostly bright light, the searchlights moving relentlessly around the prison camp. Perhaps the most striking thing was the almost total silence, hardly a sound, but the desert wind. I remember smiling to myself at the uniqueness of the quiet after so many years of living with large numbers of shouting, singing and snoring men. I thought to myself, I'm going to love freedom. When I felt I was out of earshot of the camp guards, I rose to a crouch and broke into a trot.